Good afternoon. It is my honor to introduce Edwige Danticat today. Born in Port-au-Prince, Edwige Danticat moved to New York following her parents. She began her career writing about her immigration story, and she continued from there. She launched into the national arena with her book, Breath Eyes Memory, which I consumed while working at the Haitian Refugee Center. Widely recognized for her work, she has contributed both in the nonfiction, the fiction world, and by provoking and educating. We have the good fortune of having her in our backyard, residing in Miami and choosing to share her artistry and her leadership. As I said, she uses the spoken word to educate. She advocates and she inspires. She educates the world about Haiti and the experience of the Haitian Americans. I obviously am such a fan, I can't even talk. <laughs> I can go in a courtroom, but to talk to her, it's amazing. Um, she advocates by speaking often, leveraging her status as an author um, to engage others and to promote awareness and action. She inspires by breathing life into characters, by helping us to understand who they are, how they see the world, and how they are treated by our world. She leads us through each story as someone who can shed light on experiences and help us to consider our own and the role we play in that of others. She's dedicated to not only telling the story, but changing the story. And that's why my voice shakes. With her newest book, Claire of the Sea of Light, she returns to fiction with a carefully crafted story. It talks about the relationship of the sea, which is so pivotal and central. But through the concepts of identity, abandonment, difficult choices, and the pathways that we choose in life, Set in the fictional town of V. Rose, she walks us through the experience of Claire and the complexity, tragedy, and resiliency that is Haiti and the Haitian people, as you can probably tell. It's my pleasure to introduce Edwige Danticat. Thank you so much. What a, uh, a very kind introduction. It's not good to start out making the author cry, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. I, I, I'm going to introduce Robin in a minute, so you don't think I just walk around with a blonde white woman all the time. Bodyguard. <laughs> <I'm pretty> Bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's uh, wonderful to, to have you all come. I kept saying to Robin, I was like, Robin, nobody's going to come to this thing. I live in this town. They see me all the time. So it's, um, I'm happy you, you proved me wrong. So we're, we're the, our platform is supposed to be in conversation. Robin, this is Robin Desser. She's uh, my editor at, at Kanaf. She's uh, edited, she's worked with Jhumpa Lahiri, Chimamanda uh, Adichie, Cheryl Strayed, who old Wild, who else is in your great literary okay. Esmeralda Santiago, Esmeralda Santiago, Sandra Cisneros. Um, they all make her more money than I do. <laughs> but uh, but we started. So we're, it's supposed to be a conversation, and uh, so I'll just start tell the people how we started working together. Um, I remember when uh, Breath Eyes Memory. Uh, what I, I had written this book, I wrote it as my thesis at Brown. And, and, but I've been writing it when I was 18. So sometimes when people want to be cruel about it, they say, hey, it reads like a high school student wrote it. And I'm like, a high school student wrote it. <laughs> so um, so I, I started in high school, and then um, when, and when it was um, done, I sent it to, to Laura Ruska, who was uh, my editor at Soho, and when it was bought at Vintage, and that, that's that was our first encounter by, by, by uh, Robin, who was then working at Vintage, then the day that, the, that, that she bought the paperback rights to the book, so Laura came to where I was working in a film production, and she says, Edwige, we have this, this offer from this Vintage. You have to now think about a career. And so, so Robin, in that way, started, uh, started my career and my thinking about... Uh, being a, a 
at being a writer as my career. So uh, Mitchell Kaplan had this idea that we should have a conversation. And so she will ask me things, and I will reveal deep, dark secrets. <laughs> and that's how it's going to go. That's great. Well, you know, ev everybody is going to hold her to it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I also want to thank Mitchell for having me here. This is my first time at the Miami Book Fair, and I am really just overwhelmed at the energy and the spirit and the passion of the all kinds of people who are here, the diversity. It's just such a great pleasure to be here, and that it is the 30th anniversary just seems very auspicious. Um, when Edwige and I first started working together, I think you were 22, and, I, and I had brown hair, and um, <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of water, speaking of water, there's a lot of water that has gone between us over the many years. But it's such an honor to be here with Edwige. I don't think we've ever done no. anything public. We do a lot of things behind clothes, closed doors, wrestling, laughing, <laughs> and um, just sort of having a lot of fun. It's such a, you can imagine, or maybe, you know, it's such an honor and privilege to work with Edwige's work over these many books that she has written and for us at Knopf. It's just such an honor to publish this amazing writer who, you know, as everybody here knows, um, ha is perhaps the preeminent writer of the Haitian diaspora, giving voice to her country and writing its history and um, the new book, Claire of the Sea Light. You can't have favorites, and I don't think that she's written a bad book ever, but this book is so special to me, and I just love it so much. It, um, part of the reason why is I think it has the sort of economy of a fable or a fairy tale, but it has all of the power and political importance of Edwige's work, but that it has at its center a little girl named Claire, who goes missing one night, um, gives the book some of its emotional force. And it has that thing that I love in fiction, these sort of Aristotelian unities of time and place. And all the action takes place over a single day, and then it flashes back to the past of these many characters, and their secrets are revealed, and also hints toward the future. So it's a short, propulsive, haunting, beautiful book that she won't let me call it a novel because <laughs> she says, oh, it's a novel and stories, oh, it's stories. But whatever it is, it's an uncategorizable, just brilliant, masterful book that we are so proud to be publishing. So thank you all for coming to hear us talk. And I wonder if you want to just start by talking about Claire and tell us about her name and what it means and how you found her as a character. Well, I, when I, I think I started working on... Um, a novel. I'd never like written a novel just from scratch, except the Farming of Bones, where I was like, I'm going to start writing a novel. It's going to be about this. Things, other things, I've just kind of uh, tripped on. So Claire, I I thought I, I started with this idea. I'm going to write a novel that's like a radio show, and every episode of the of the every chapter will be an episode of the show. It'll have a hostess named Louise George. And so I started, and then I was watching uh, a documentary about Haitian children in Haiti and children who are, who are placed in orphanages but who are not orphans. So their parents will bring them to an orphanage and, and then the parents will visit them on holidays when they can give them something but they turn them over to this orphanage because they, they, they can't support them. And there was a uh, a man I remember in this documentary who said, you know, they, they give their kids away because they, it's not, they're not like us. They're, they don't have the same attachment to their, to their children. And, and, and I was so, I felt so wounded by that because I, you know, I, I, I hadn't, I'd spent like really the early part of my life with my parents living in another, in another country working and I knew the difficulties of that choice. And then just like that, Claire, this character came to me, and almost fully in her, in her, you know, in her fullness. And I wrote, then I wrote a, a short, the f first part, like this, the first part of the book as a short story that was in Haiti Noir. And then slowly, this town, you know, started Ville Rose, which is based after, uh, based after my mother, where my mother grew up in Leogan. So uh, then the town just emerged from from just this little bit of like anger at this at this man in a documentary. The town is the same town that, or it has the same name as the town in Crick Crack. And mm -hmm. I just wonder if things have changed over the years. Yeah, well, actually, I, I decided to, 
the town, when I, when I decided to do Ville Rose, I, in Breath Eye's memory, I had some real towns and some fake towns. And the people who were from the real towns would say, you know, you say that there's a tree on this road. <laughs> I have been there. I've not seen it. <laughs> And, and they'll say, that's what's wrong with you diasporas, you know, you, you get everything wrong. And so I said, I'm going to invent my own town, and I can put whatever I want in it. So I can put, I wanted a lighthouse in my town, and I wanted all these things. So, and my mother's name is Rose. And so I decided to name the, the town Ville Rose. So in, in Creek Crack, I just had a vague idea of what it was. And, and over, like when we started when, when uh, the first draft of the book that I gave to you, that was one of the things I think also this might be interesting for people who want to be writers, how this process works. So, so then, then, you know, Robin was saying, I really want to see the town. I really want to see the town. And I was tempted to just send her a picture. <laughs> but, um, but so then you, you just, then the town develops, you know, and then you add, you add layers. So then the town grew a lot in detail from from the mansion in Creek Crack. And Creek Crack, it's in a story called um, 1937. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing the manuscript had in the early draft was dates. Yeah. We spent a lot of time talking about dates, and, um, and then we decided let's not have any dates. And um, I think, you know, some of this had to do with the earthquake mm -hmm. in Haiti. And I wonder if you want to talk about the earthquake and its impact on you and uh, this book in particular, and why? Why did we decide to do that again? Well, I think because the the thing was this was going to this was going to be the first work of fiction that I was going to publish after the earthquake, and I knew that for anybody who would pick up that book, they would you know who would pick up this book, they would say, I wonder if it's an earthquake book. I wonder if it's after the earthquake, and I knew personally that I wasn't ready to write a fictional a, a fictional book about the earthquake because first of all I you know I wasn't there and I think and and there was and I had written a little bit about and and created dangerously about the people my my cousin and my his son who had died and the way that it had affected my family and I didn't I didn't feel like I was ready to write it um in fiction so then we had the dates because the book also spends 10 years I think at first it was a kind of um organizational structure for myself. And then when you write a book like this with this kind of structure, some people think you're lazy. Some people think you're, you know, like they'll say it's unfocused, but, you know, like the whole, without realizing all the mechanisms. So I had the dates at first to keep it straight to myself. And I knew the book would go up to 2009, that it wouldn't go to the earthquake because if it, if it, was, a, an, if it was an earthquake, a post-earthquake book, it would have to be a book about the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And I started writing this book in 2005 and I wrote some of it after the earthquake, and I think people can feel some of those parts, sort of the more, you know, well, when I can't say a word like that, I say, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. <laughs> but sort of the more, uh, the parts that, uh, that sort of are like about mourning, I think, are, are set there. But I, I really, at first I was really determined to make it clear that it was 2009, and then I think people can... Uh, can figure it out that it is a before and not an after. It's a no, book. That, yeah, it's a book that time and dates. You know, it's it's kind of brilliant because it takes place. You know, as I said, over one day, but then it spans all this time and then time and the sense of time because Claire and we should tell the story for those of you who haven't read it. That Claire uh, goes missing, and you know, I'll ask you why that is. But that the fact that there's a sort of ticking clock. Uh, Claire decides to run away for a reason. I'm going to ask Edwige to explain, but she runs away. And then there's this ticking clock of, is she going to be found? And you know it's going to be the end of the day. And so you're, you know, your, your heart is in your throat over this missing child. And um, so it winds up being something that is a really brilliant way of building suspense in a book. But will you explain what happened you know, in terms of Claire and what happens with her father. Um, and some, some ways in which I thought of the book was sort of a combination of the old man and the sea and our town, because it takes place in a fishing village. This is what publishers do. This book is unique, but it's exactly like these other books. <laughs> we have this very bad disease. But, um, but, but so explain you know, what happens with Claire and why she runs away. 
Well, Claire's, Claire's father, Nuzias, decides, Claire's mother dies in childbirth, so her father decides that he is not able to take care of her because also his work as a fisherman, there's less and less possibilities for him to make a living. So he decides he's going to give her to a well-off woman in town, Madame Gaël, whose own daughter had, uh, had died tragically and she had also lost her husband. So he decided he's going to place his daughter with her so she can have a better life. And then um, Claire, he spends practically her whole life doing that and he, each year on her birthday he tries again and then um, on her seventh birthday Madame Gaël finally says yes and then Claire realizes that she'll be separated from her father and so she, she runs away but earlier in the day there had been an, an incident at sea that makes you worry where she might have, where she might have, uh, have gone but we spent a very for me I think Claire uh, a character like that becomes like your child because um, Claire was almost exactly the same age as my, as my oldest, who's on the cover. <laughs> and, um, and so it was really like, I mean, I think all acts of writing is about what if, like what if I had to make this choice? What if I had to be in the position of this person? And then it was just even closer. So we had, I had a very hard time. Like Robin kept saying, tell me what happened, like where does she go? And you, where does she go? And... And, um, and I really had a hard time deciding that. I think part of it because I was very much emotionally invested for my own reasons because I, I, not, you know, I was in an orphanage, but I grew up in, with my aunt and uncle in a house with a lot of children like me whose parents were abroad. And, and I think it was just like this kind of cycle where I was thinking what it was like for me as, a, as being this child and what it might be like for me as a parent to have to make that decision, which I think is a very underestimated decision for people in the developing world. And it's so that these broad judgments are made about it, like, oh, they do this to their, you know, without understanding the difficulty of that layer. I think it's the, I think it's the most, I mean, it, it's, it's just probably one of the hardest choices a parent could have to make, but it's underestimated often for, for what it's like for poor people to have, to make that decision, to have so little control over your fate and the faith of your child that you, you cannot even, you're not even able to keep them with you. Yeah. We were really happy when the very fierce literary critic from the New York Times, Michiko Kakatani, gave the book a rave review. And, um, you know, of course, in, in Brother, I'm Dying, you write about this, your sense of abandonment when your father, first your father left and then your mom when you were a little girl. And um, so Michiko Kakatani called the book haunting and then she said, in Dante Ka's own story and in this novel story of Claire, love endures in the face of death and departure and disappointment. And, um, you know, it made me want to ask you, so fiction is a way of, you know, it's cathartic or a way of restoring the truth or sort of how sort of balancing this and how personal this book was for you in that respect? Well, I think, you know, fiction is in some ways a way of, of exercising your one's demons at time. And it's, um, it's, you know, there's a, in that movie, Daughters of, there's a movie, Daughters of the Dust, in which there's a woman, Yellow Mary, uh, who says, you know, I put, I, I wish I could put all my pains in one box and all my memories in one box and then visit them at will. You know, we don't often get that that choice, that 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 privilege, but it was. It's a way of just like if you're afraid of something, and um, and the, the that beautiful introduction, like she said, it's like you you can write change into being, right? Like in in life, we have so little control about the situations we find ourselves in, like Nozias with his with his daughter and. And, and our fates. I think, I think also the, the poorer people are, the sort of less control you have over your fate. But in, um, in fiction, you can, you can really go through all these scenarios and then decide how they end, you know? And, and, and I think it's a way of, it's a way of, of dealing with the, with the personal. I mean, I think it's, it's a very, I wouldn't say it's just, it's just therapy, but sometimes you're working through things that you're not even aware of. And sometimes, do you remember when we had that, this conversation at, at some point where I, I, was, I said, oh my gosh, Robin, this, 
a friend of mine had read the book, for the, and the fir that was the first time somebody had said, I said, wish this book is about your father. Yeah. And I said, no, that other book was about my father, brother, I'm dying. <laughs> and then they said, you know, this is about your father. You have written for yourself a childhood with your father. And so, and I had no, you know, I hadn't even, I hadn't thought of, it, of the book that way. It's funny, when you're working on a book with someone, you know, sometimes after it comes out, you sort of see, okay, here's what people say about it, here's what readers say about it, here's what people bring to it. But, you know, when you're in the middle of it, sometimes, you know, it's you're working on instinct as well as, you know, thinking about structure, time, and all of these things, sentences. But then sometimes you kind of realize, hang on, wait a second. You know, and then this thing that you were saying about the radio, so many things happen because of something that somebody says on the radio or... Um, it's something that happens at the radio station. Somebody is killed. And, you know, it was only later that you told me this thing about the radio and what it meant, and I didn't know that. And then suddenly you sort of see, oh, maybe I should have written about this in the copy or something. But, you know, that these, these threads work their way through fiction as it's being written. And it be, it's just such an incredible experience to, to see that form over drafts that happen. It's, it's wonderful. You know, um, the... Um, the other thing is I wanted to ask you about your kids and uh, who are... Who, are they, are they both? Have they bailed? There they are. There they are. <laughs> Hi. And oh. how, they, how they handle have, having a famous mom and, oh, what, and boy, what, and what that's you, I like. wish you hadn't said that. They're, how do you handle well, having a famous mom? Well, because I think mom? My, my kids, when they're... See, my, my husband is like so friendly. They think he's the mayor of this town. <laughs> so, so they'll say, like, they'll say, when we go to Publix with Papa, it takes so long to get through the aisle. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and I'm, I'm the one, like, dodging people. So they, he, he's famous. Okay? He's your famous Papa's favorite. Papa's famous. Papa's famous. Do yeah. you think that, ha they think that having kids, I mean, some people, writers, you could see uh, that, that sometimes people's writing changes when they have kids, they have to think of their own time so differently and how you are balancing that with writing. But also if you feel that anything changed in your writing and how you're writing, what you're writing about after your kids are born or now that they're growing up, you know, if it has changed anything or not. Well, I think it's, um, you know, it's, I don't, I, I didn't know this about parenting until I, you know, became a parent. It's sort of, the height of vulnerability, you know, it's like somebody says your your heart is walking around outside, and I, you know, I'm getting like my voice is getting like stressing, and and so I'm just glad that I had this avenue in which to to process that, whether it's you know through through the fiction or other ways, and um, and because I and it also, for example, you know, Mira, that like the moment she came to be was like in Brother I'm Dying. I talk about that too when my when my father was dying, and 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 we almost felt like he willed her to be, mm -hmm. you know, because he when I we found out that he was he had he, was, he had a case of terminal um, pulmonary fibrosis that the day that I found out that that we were pregnant, and then and so through the whole thing, my father you know, was like, I'm, I want, I'm going to stick around to meet the firstborn of my firstborn. And so, and then I, I feel like I would be crazy if I didn't have a book in which to have worked that out, like with Brother I'm Dying. So when people talk about, sometimes they talk in a very dismissive way about the therapeutic nature of the book. I mean, I think it's not so much the book. I think for me it was the therapeutic nature of the process. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so working to that and then coming into just like having a space in which to explore these like all other chambers of my heart that, it, that I've sort of um, grown through this process. And I, and I think also, I mean, so through this book, I think I was better able to understand Claire's vulnerability. I mean, I think not that I couldn't have perhaps imagined it, but I think, I think watching children every day and the sort of their little joys and their little hurts. I think all of that was able to, to contribute to it. And I know that maybe, I see this with Breath Eyes Memory, like when you open a book and sometimes you will look at a line that has nothing to do with what's actually happened in the book, but it brings you back to certain moments where you can imagine sort of the life parallels of, mm 
of that moment in the book. And certainly I feel like this book for me and this is monumental in that way in terms of you know coming into motherhood and just trying to to process that through life through through mm. through the work so it's not necessarily less exposed or vulnerable for you to write fiction than nonfiction no i think i mean it's the same because you i think because the from the person from which it's coming you sort of know the source i think in terms of how pe what people are reading, uh, because of course you, you know, it's not like you're, you want to tell every single thing about yourself. I, I think we do live in that age where people tell a lot about themselves. But um, when you write it through the fiction, in a way, it's almost coded. So then you could, you know exactly what's going on in a certain point, but the reader also is getting mm -hmm. um, something different out of it. Mm -hmm. You want to tell me, or I don't, I don't have to listen. You want to tell them what you're working on now, and I won't listen? Or I won't. <laughs> um, well, I'm working on... I, I got the... Laura Ruska, who's passed away, who uh, did Breath Eyes Memory with me, was my editor for Breath Eyes Memory. She, uh, she said... She gave me, I think, was a really great advice. And it, for a first book, everything is new. You don't know... I mean, it's, in a way, it's beautiful, because... You don't know about bad reviews. You don't know about. You're just like. You never heard of Michiko Kakatani. Yeah, example. like you know, and and so maybe not now for people. But when I was like all those many years ago, when I was starting out, I was just so happy that I had a book that was that was going to be published. And you're just you're just blissful. And so and and that bliss, you know, after Laura told me I should think about a career, part of thinking about a career, she said was, well, you want to. Every time you're, when you're done, you want to get something going so that by the time the book is published, you'll have something you're working on. So if it's brutally, like, you know, if people hate it, critics hate it, and then at least you won't have to pick yourself up the floor and, you know, in your drunken stupor, grab <laughs> a pen. And, and, you know, so you already have something going. Right, and if and also, I mean, that's the thing that people aren't aware of. The other, I don't know if it just works for me that way, but I've seen it with a lot of friends and and people who it's your first book, everybody loves it, and you have this great thing, and that can be just as crippling for young writers as the other thing, you know, where you're just like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? What I, and mm -hmm. and I've seen people handle it very, you know, like Jumpa who wins the Pulitzer for. Her first book. I mean, she's done a, and I'd, she was very good at just like continuing. But so that advice of just working on something. So all that to say, yes, I started working. I'm working on a young adult book, not with Robin. I'm cheating on Robin. Yeah, she does that. <laughs> when um, you have a CV like this, which ranges, you know, if you look her up on Wikipedia, you look at the range of things that she's doing this. I, mean, I have to find this out on Wikipedia. All well, think of, you know, imagine my mother. <laughs> my mother's always like, You're, what, you didn't, what did you tell me this? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I'm working, I'm doing on a YA with, with uh, Scholastics, and I'm working on that. Now, it's set in Miami, and um, I always thought I would have to leave Miami to write. I, was, I have to leave places mm. to write about them. But um, it's, it seems to be working. That's great. That's great. Do, now, do we want uh, people to open this up to questions? Do people have questions, Fred Weish? Yeah. Oh, okay. The reading. We, we, we programmed her to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs> um, so I'll... I'll read. We we wanted. I, first, I said I, I should pick one uh, a part that Robin and I fought about the most. But <laughs> but then I realized that part's not in the book anymore. <laughs> um, so this is this is uh, Max um, Junior. I'm, I'm, we're trying. We're trying to keep everybody. Is, is it good time wise? Because no, we're trying to keep yeah, you on good. track. No, so this is one of the characters, Max Junior comes back, he lives in Miami, he goes back to, to Haiti after 10 years to meet uh, a child that he had conceived with, with a woman who was working in his uh, father's house, and he had never met the child before, but he met the child that day. And the sea is a big character in the book, so Max, it's Max um, Jr. at sea. 
Now, as he walked fully clothed to the water, Max Jr. thought of his father's version of a Cornish folktale, one the old man had told him when he was little. In the story, a boy is lured into the woods by music. The deeper the boy walks into the woods, the denser the woods become, and the more beautiful the music. The boy follows this music until he gets so lost that he no longer knows where he is. He becomes so scared that he wants to return home, but he also wants to follow the music to see where it leads. After he walks so far that the woods become impassable, he begins to cry for help, and that's when a spirit emerges and makes a path for him. The path leads to the sea. When he wakes up, the boy finds himself back home, safely in his own bed, with his head full of music and mermaids and crystal palaces under the sea. The spirit in the woods saved this boy, his father said, because the spirit wanted the boy to remain good and innocent, and that innocent and goodness was as precious as the dreams that she had placed in his head. Max Jr. now slipped into the water, feeling the cool waves rise and fall around him. And the sea, he thought of that music. He also thought of flowers and birds. He thought of the birdhouses he and his father had built together when he was a boy. He thought of the orchids and roses in his father's garden. He thought of how the roses had been pummeled the night of the hailstorm. He thought of his mother and her favorite flowers. She would tie a bouquet of yellow jasmine to the bell on the front of her bicycle, then ride through the town. You are who you love, she told him. You try to mend what you have torn, but remember that love is like kerosene. The more you have, the more you burn. He imagined the drawing now melting, coming apart in his pen pocket as he walked through the sea, a drawing made by his son whom he had just met, his son, whom he might never see again. Would meeting him today have meant anything at all to his son? The worst possible case of unrequited love, his father had told him, was feeling rejected by a parent. Was the second worst being rejected by your child? People like to say of the sea that la mer pa can be crass. The sea does not hide dirt. It does not keep secrets. The sea was both hostile and docile, the ultimate trickster. It was as large as it was small, as long as you could claim a portion of it for yourself. You could scatter both ashes and flowers in it. You could take as much from it, but it could take back too. You could make love in it, or you could surrender to it. And oddly enough, surrendering at sea felt somewhat like surrendering on land taking a deep breath, and simply letting go. You could just as easily lie in the sea as you might in the woods and simply forever fall asleep. Thank you. Hi, it was beautiful. Um, as an editor and a writer, what feedback do you think you've received that sort of stimulated you to take the writing to the next level from your editor? And for the editor, what do you think you get feedback you give to your authors that you get the most from? Well, I think um, Robin is one of those rare editors because I, I have a lot of writer friends who say, you know, I'm not edited, and some of them hire freelance editors. Um, and so... Uh, you know, Fado, my husband, makes a, a joke about that I, have two, that I have two Robin dolls. I have one that I stick pins into <laughs> and one that I dance with. So I, I think all writers have, the, have this fantasy of, like, I'm going to submit my book to my editor, and she's going to say, this is the best thing I've ever read. Don't touch a comma, you know? And so, and then so Robin will say, you know, it's, it's, it's great. And then she'll write you 10 or 20 pages of notes. But I think it's always, the, the essence of your advice is always dig deeper. D like, dig deeper. And, and so, and, and I think it's, that's, that's been, 
the, the most important thing, like go deeper, like... Mm -hmm. You know what, the thing is, you, the best thing, one of the best things that happens is if you say to somebody, like there's this, for, just as a dumb example, okay, so there's a scene in which a character is making lunch, and you don't know what the lunch is, and so you say, I don't know, should they have a sardine sandwich? Then the scene comes back, and they're not having lunch. Something else is happening uh, completely, and you read this, and you think, oh, you know, I made this idiotic comment and something has gone deeper or has been transformed that you, that you sort of react to something and then some other alchemy happens because you are not the writer. The writer is the writer. And that is, you know, as an editor, it's so amazing to think that a comment that you make can actually cause something else to happen for a writer's work. There really isn't anything more rewarding than that from this editorial process. And, you know, you can imagine what working with someone like this is in that regard. It's just such a privilege, really. Mm -hmm. Well, Edwidge, I want to thank you again. I, I read your book on a seaside town on the beach for two days in, in, um, uh, in Haiti. So it was absolutely delicious to just smell the sea salt and read uh, about the, a village by the sea. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to thank you. I, recently I went to uh, the opening of... Uh, of a school or part of a school in Haiti, and the person who was thanking the donor said, thank you so much for showing these children that somebody loves them. And of course, we were all outraged, and, and I really want to thank you. And I, I'm always getting teary-eyed for describing in such achingly beautiful details how poor people, poor parents in Haiti love their children, and how fathers love their children. Our, our men have been demonized in a way to say that they're evil, they're the white beaters, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I really thank you for showing this complexity that, that, that makes up who we are. Um, you've mm -hmm. also talked about, described sort of this class dynamics in the village where, you know, you, you have, you know, the upper classes, it's a village where everyone knows their place, but still there's this sort of interaction between, you know, between the, 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 the stratas. Um, is this something that you would say is typical, or is this something that you've created? Is this a set of relationships that you've created for your village? Well, I think you know there was, like even the my my grandmother, my mother's mother, who her house still stands in this part of Leogan. So my grandmother, we were not rich by any means, but my mother's mother was um, a Napoleon, that was her last name, and the place where they lived was, was called Cité Napoleon. So when we, we, we didn't really always like going to Grandma Grace's house because everything, there was like, there was like the lace curtain and everything, and we would sit there, and, and the only fun thing was like, then afterwards, like a very formal type of lunch, you would go to, to the beach where someone would almost always drown, it was like always the thing, but, um, but it was like she was, like she, her people looked down at my father's people. So it was like this whole, like, it wasn't like if, there was the, the super rich people at the top, but even there were all these, these layers that I tried to capture the dynamics in that town. So, so she could look down on my father's people, but if she went to the fabric shop, then that woman was looking down at her. Mm -hmm. but, but then there, was, there, was, there were other ways that those people, sometimes they were all related somehow, but someone had gone off and married someone else. So I wanted to, to capture that element of the dynamics. And of course, where everybody, every, you know, where, where class disappears is in the dark. So, <laughs> and, and with all like the, sort of like the, all, the, the uh, these romantic dalliances and sometimes these violent interactions where, uh, where a girl who, 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 who is Iris Aveco works in someone's house becomes like the, the, man of the house's first sexual experience. Like all these things I wanted mm -hmm. to, um, some of it I, you know, I, I, I think I borrowed from actual things, but you let the imagination also. But, but thank you typical, for what you said. It's not typical of Haitian society, the sort of mixing of the, of the classes. Would the mixing? The, the sort of almost fluid, you know, sort of, I, I don't want to say too much, but there, there, there are parts where you know, there's this sort of person who interacts with someone who's clearly not in her station in life. And well, so I wouldn't. Be, I I listen in City Napoleon. They did, and people, and you know, I think, 
I wouldn't say that it never, one wouldn't say it never happens. And the thing that, that there are people who marry beyond, I mean, it doesn't happen as a common thing, but there are places where, where it does happen, where people break the sort of, the, the, there are different rules, and especially in a, in a, in a small place like that. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, I'm also just an enormous fan of yours. I was Thank telling you. Robin that yesterday. Um, question. You have such gorgeous prose, and it's one of the things that I've long admired about your work. And your work, when I read it, your writing is so rhythmic. And I wondered from a craft perspective, or just you know, what do you do to put yourself in that space where you can write with so much rhythm and soul, and it, it is sort of fable-like on the page every time I read you. Oh, thank you. I mean, I have to... I, I feel like I have to fall in love with the story myself. And um, even sort of in the construction of the town, just as soon as I could see it, as soon as I, was, I, as, soon as I dug really deep and I, I, it was very clear to me visually that I, was, I felt like I was walking those streets and I, was, you know, I, was, I knew those people. So the, the hard part is just to just then get the mechanics down in terms of where you place yourself in the story. And then, the, and then you're, you're just there, you're flowing uh, through it. And it's but it but this is like also probably it's a lot of editing. Like I saw, I was watching the live broadcast of the National Book Awards. Ru Freeman and you guys were there, <laughs> but um, and Robin was there. But Maya Angelou there says, uh, "What is said? Easy reading is damn hard writing." <laughs> and and there's a lot of revision to to get to that. And the revision is a way of peeling layers of of you also getting to know the characters better, getting to know their nuances so that you can then go past the mechanics of just like, where does everybody go? What do they have for lunch? To, to actually then really delving into, into the language and, and, and layering and adding on top of it. I think we're, they were trying to keep on track. So thank you so very much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.